Morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Next Lions Science Cafe here at the Edgewater. I'm not Max Harris from WPOW. My name is James Ty. I'm the executive director of the Lakes Lions. Uh, we're so thankful for WPOW being our media partner. Uh, Max uh, will see back at the station uh, looking out for wildfires that are in the southern part of the state right now. You might have noticed that the governor did a warning yesterday. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here today who's joining us here at the Edgewater. Thank you for coming out and all those people uh, joining us virtually at home. Thank you very much. Thank you for signing up. Uh, today, we're going to learn more about our human waste, or specifically how the Madison Metropolitan Sewer District is removing phosphorus from our wastewaters. While phosphorus is an essential nutrient that we consume every day, it can be harmful to our lakes and waters by fueling unwanted cyanobacteria blooms that close our beaches. Mass Metropolitan Sewer District recovers the phosphorus for the beneficial use uh, for our lands while also working to protect our local water resources. Remember, if you're joining us online, to be sure to use the Q&A function on your screen and ask questions at any time, and Adam will get back to you about those uh, at the end of the presentation. Before we start today, I want to introduce Paul Tyson from National Guardian Life Insurance Company to tell us more about today's speaker, as well as give some remarks about the clinic clients and what's going on here. Thank you very much. Thanks, James, and uh, thanks to everyone who is joining us here at the Edgewater today, as well as online. National Guardian Life is proud to once again be a supporting sponsor of these talks. I'd like to thank the other sponsors, our presenting sponsor, First Weber, the hosting sponsor, the Edgewater. Joining NGL as a supporting sponsor is Alliant Energy, and our production sponsors, the UW Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the UW Extension. As James said, we're happy to have WKOW as a media sponsor. The National Guardian Life Insurance Company has been a part of this great Madison community for more than a century. We're located right next door to Edgewater. Uh, NGL specializes in a suite of insurance products for life's journey that gives people the financial stability, careful guidance, and peace of mind to help them live a life filled with confidence, dignity, and grace. We're focused on helping people, and that extends beyond our agents and policyholders to our community. NGL is honored to be able to give back and help make our community a better place for everyone. A few quick updates. First, our annual Clean Lakes Alliance Community Breakfast is coming up in a little less than three weeks. Individual tickets are available for purchase on our website, or if you're interested in being a table captain or sponsor, you can reach out to our development director, Alex Vitani. This year's breakfast will be Wednesday, May 3rd at the Manoma Terrace, and will feature keynote speaker, Samantha Scanandor, an enrolled member of the Hochschild Nation, who will talk on the past of our watershed and what we need to do for clean and healthy waters into the future. We'll also hear from Dane County Executive Joe Parisi, as well as get the first look at the State of the Lake Report, which recaps how the lakes did last year. Second, registration is also open for a popular Loop the Lake bike ride taking place on Saturday, June 17th. All entrants receive a super soft shirt, compliments of lands on a meal at one of 14 food trucks at either Olin or Oldbridge Park. And of course, because it's Wisconsin, a complimentary beer at the end, courtesy of Wisconsin distributors. The ride, which goes around Lake Monona, is family friendly, with kids 10 and under riding free with the paid adult. Back to today's, today's talk. Dr. Matt Seid, process and research engineer at the Madison Metropolitan Schools District. Dr. Seid is involved in several water industry advocacy organizations, such as the Water Environment Federation, and the Water Research Foundation. 
He holds a PhD from Marquette University in civil engineering, specialization in anaerobic biotechnology. His job at MMSD includes daily operations, innovation, and planning studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mansai. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Morning, morning. I, I, I really appreciate that introduction by James, but I feel like you, you got the whole presentation, so we'll go home right now. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about what the sewage district is doing, um, specifically with phosphorus. And uh, you know, fair warning, we're talking about sewage, so I might drop the keyword, the poop word, once or twice here. And I'm always amazed at how many people will get up this early to talk about sewage. So we might have a few. All right. So what are we? What am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to go through a couple topics and anchor the presentation here. First, we're going to talk about phosphorus and you. Uh, give you a quick wastewater parameter so when everyone leaves, you'll be able to go and operate the plant for us uh, when we're done. And then we'll specifically talk about some of the things that we are uh, working on at, at the district with the phosphorus management. And we'll, we'll uh, end with some questions. So, first, phosphorus cycle. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room has heard phosphorus, right? And, and with James's introduction, um, Obviously, people are aware that it could be a problem in waterways. Um, the phosphorus is a complex element. It's uh, it's everywhere. It, it moves in and out of lots of things. And so I like to check as an engineer and scientist. I like to think about what are what's the, the model of how phosphorus is moving in and out of different systems. And so this is one one example I found on the internet um, the other day. And you know, you know, how does how is this presenting phosphorus? Well, it's, it's being mined, it's being used on land, it's you know, there's some runoff, it's being used to grow crops. And you know, I would kind of look at this model and say there's kind of basically two separate sites. There's the terrestrial systems, the land-based systems, and then water systems. Um, but what I find kind of interesting about this, this model of phosphorus is uh there's kind of this big empty space where all of us would kind of find ourselves. We're kind of in the, the space of this model where phosphorus is being used to grow food, we eat food, and, and that's kind of where everyone in the room is generally finding themselves, unless you're a phosphate miner or a farmer, you're probably the, the consumer of growing phosphorus. But that model, you know, is, is pretty vague, right? It doesn't really show you the, the person in it. Um, so I, I scoured the internet a little bit more and found a, another example of, of how phosphorus is used in society. And this one gets, you know, a few more details. So now this model is talking about agricultural uses, industrial uses, um, waste products. So it's 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 hinting at um, a little bit more of the details of human activity and how phosphorus is being used um, in in all these complex cycles. And so again, red circle, this is probably where all of us in this room probably find ourselves connected to, to general phosphorus levels. Unless you live at the bottom of the lake, um, you're probably in the red circle. So, but again, it's, it's, these are kind of abstract models for the everyday person. Maybe a more simplified way of thinking about phosphorus is, is this kind of a model where you know, there's people, there's food systems, there's water systems, and then there's wastewater system. So all of us need water and food to live. We're getting that water from the water source. We're getting that food from the food source. Uh, little secret here, we all produce waste and it has to go somewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the district and, and wastewater plants all over the country have the responsibility to manage that waste for you. Um, but so what do we do with that? We, we reclaim that water so that it can be returned back into um, another cycle and then we can use that water again. Um, and then we take the residuals from that, that wastewater and we put it back into the food system so we can grow more food with it. So here's you know maybe a, a more simplified example of how everyday people kind of connect with phosphorus in, in a direct way. Um, but again, this since this is a simplified model, one thing I'll just mention is 
it's maybe a little too simple. There's lots of other things that you use in your daily life that work you know, that have phosphorus in them, mostly consumer products. So think about soap, other personal care products that may have phosphorus, but those phosphorus compounds may or may not have a plant based source. That phosphorus is getting into the wastewater as well. So it's not just about phosphorus from the food system, there's phosphorus in other places. What am I be so far? All right. So now let's talk about wastewater. How do we deal with, with wastewater and, and how do we deal with phosphorus today? So I'm going to go through a, a number of things here. Um, first, I'll give you a quick primer on the district for those of you who are less familiar with it. Uh, talk about how we collect the wastewater, get it to the plant, and then we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on, on how the wastewater is treated so that um, everyone can kind of understand how we'll then recover and reuse it. So the district, we uh, serve around 400,000 people in and around the Madison areas. Um, we own and operate about 145 miles of pipe. That's either gravity interceptors or force mains. Um, that's in a service area that covers about 187 square miles. We operate 18 regional pumping stations uh, that send that wastewater to the central Mansfield treatment plant where we're processing about 36 million gallons of flow every day. Uh, it takes about 125 full-time staff to do this. So you know, visually, what does that mean? Uh, the map on the left is showing uh, you know, collection area in gray. So you know, we're basically handling wastewater from all the major communities in, in and around the Madison Lakes. Um, and the, the black circles are where each of our pumping stations are located. The, the lines are um, our, our major interceptors, so 145 miles of pipe. And the, the gold star is the treatment point where all that water is being conveyed. The picture on the right is the inside of one of the pumping stations. So it's just giving a sense of scale of what one of those stations looks like down in the ground. So there's a lot of big pumps, a lot of big pipes, and we're moving quite a bit of water um, every day. So this is where I get to use my bad dad joke. Um, we're going to do a high level tour of the plant right now um, with this aerial photo. So I'm going to walk you through real quick uh, the treatment plant and how. What are, what are we looking at here? What's happening? Um, before I do that, who's been to the next person? Okay, so this is a review. Um, for, for those of you who haven't, um, here we go. So first thing, wastewater is coming into what we call our headworks building. This is where we are measuring flow, sampling the wastewater to look at the, the waste constituents and figure out how to fill our older communities for the services we provide. Um, we also do some preliminary uh, treatment here where we are removing grit and large debris, so any kind of garbage or trash that might have found its way into the sewer. And I know we're talking about phosphorus today, but I got to do a quick aside and remind everyone that toilets are not trash cans. So this Headworks building is there to basically pull trash out of sewage, and we don't want it there. Um, all we're you know we're pulling up flushable wipes, tampon applicators, condoms, rubber duckies, shoes. We had bowling balls, survey rods, bricks, pieces of wood. Um, that stuff's a problem for us. Please don't put it down the drain. All we're doing is pulling it out, and putting it in the landfill. It's very expensive for us to do it. It would be easier if everyone just put that in the garbage. You know, in the first place. So just the three P's, P, poop, and toilet paper, please. No cooking grease either. That's no, no thank you. All right, back to the tour. So after high works, the next thing we, we do is we call primary treatment. And this is another physical separation process. We're using gravity to uh, perform treatment here. Uh, oils, fats, and grease, anything that's more lighter than water will float to the top of these tanks and skim it off. Um, anything that is readily settleable will sink to the bottom, we we'll scoop that off the bottom. And so the only thing coming out of these tanks is the waste that will not be removed by gravity one way or the other. So it's anything dissolved or anything colloidal that will settle. 
And then that water moves into what we call secondary treatment, active sludge. And this is where we are removing those dissolved and colloidal uh, components. And right here we're using biology to perform that work. So we're using bacteria to, to gobble up all that stuff and um, get rid of it one way or the other. And then, um, then the last step is secondary clarification where we are separating that biology from the water to release it to the environment. So the bacteria are, are heavy, they sink. So they, they fall to the bottom of these tanks, we suck them up, put them back in the, the activated sludge tanks and recycle that bacteria. And then the clarified water comes to the top and it's what's ultimately returned to the environment. So one of my uh, former colleagues like to say, we're not a drinking water plant, we are a surface water production facility. We make river water. So you can't drink this, but it's good enough to put back in the river. Um, so if you're paying close attention, this was the liquid side of treatment, but we have these residuals that are left over from the primary tanks and these, these clarifiers. So um, another big part of what we do is residuals management. We have all these solids that are left over that we have to treat. Um, first, that material gets sent to a solids processing complex where we are concentrating those solids up. So we have less volume to manage. And then we put those solids through dige anaerobic digestion, uh, where we're breaking that waste down, destroying the pathogens in the solids, and turning um, that material into biogas that we can use to heat and power the plant. So we can use the sewage to offset about 30% of our electricity demands when we heat the plant most of the year with um, the methane that we produce from these digesters. Um, after that material comes out of digestion, it's, it's known as bile solids. We put that into some large storage tanks, and that's ultimately what becomes what we call metrogrill, and is uh, the material that we return to farm fields. And we'll get into that a lot more in a little bit. And then the last thing in the picture here is our strubic harvesting building. So another thing that we do is we have a, a side stream process where we are specifically trying to capture phosphorus in a pretty unique way um, and converting that phosphorus into a, a mineral precipitate that we use as a fertilizer. And um, we'll get into that in a lot more in a second. Uh, before we, we get into the, the phosphorus recovery, though, I want to talk a little bit more about um, what it means to do that biological treatment in those um, aeration tanks. So as a wastewater process engineer, I, I think of the wastewater kind of as having three general things that, that I got to deal with. There's phosphorus, there's ammonia, and there's organics, or what we call biochemical oxygen demand. Those are the things that we are trying to get out of the water before we return it to the environment. Uh, biologically, there's different groups of organisms that um, will deal with each of these general constituents. So there's certain organisms that are really good at removing the phosphorus, certain ones that are taking care of ammonia, and others that are, are going into the organics. Now, for, for the ammonia, what we're doing is we're converting that ammonia, which is toxic to fish, to nitrates, um, which is not toxic to fish. And some of that nitrate we're then converting to nitrogen gas with yet another group of organisms. So that's what would be known as the nitrification and denitrification effect that was a large biologist. Um, but what's some nuances here is that uh, these phosphorus organisms and the organisms that uh, convert nitrate to nitrogen gas also use our energy. So there's lots of competition. In, in our biological systems for the waste. The, the, we're actually using the waste for one component to treat the other component of the waste, which is kind of neat. And what's also pretty pretty nice about the way we've designed the process is we're not using any chemicals. The only input to performing this biological treatment is energy to aerate the water. So the organisms that perform this work require oxygen, so as long as we can supply adequate oxygen to the bacteria, they just take care of it for us, which is really nice. So, you know, minimal, minimal inputs to actually do this work. I mean, 
And when I say minimal, I mean one one and but we do use quite a bit of energy, and that's a big part of my job is to figure out how to use less energy to do this. Um, but a little bit further down the rabbit hole here, those aeration tanks are actually quite complex from, from the, the aerial view, it just looks like a tank with an air bubble in for it, but it's much more than that. Um, the, those tanks are actually broken up into various zones. So there's aer anaerobic zone where there's no oxygen presence. There's an anoxic zone where oxygen is present in the form of nitrate, but not O2. And then there's um, aerobic zones where oxygen is present as O2. And the reason for that is that all those different organisms that are dealing with different waste constituents need um, different kinds of environments to engage their metabolism to do what we want them to do. So you're, you're creating selective environments for these organisms to um, manipulate their metabolism, to, to accumulate that phosphorus in their cells, to convert that ammonia to nitrate and to then convert some of that nitrate to nitrogen gas. And, and the last component here is, so all those things we're just talking about, they're happening all over the place here. So the point of this slide is not for you to be a, be a master of it, but just to, uh, the takeaway is there's a lot going on here. It's not just a tank of airport where there's quite a bit of science happening, which is why I have a job. Um, all right, so to review, you know, there's lots of, there's multiple physical and biological processes happening to deal with um, the liquid stream of the wastewater. We're not using chemicals for liquid treatment, so we're not using chemicals to remove phosphorus. Some plants do that, but here in the next city don't. Um, the biology we're using is naturally occurring. We're not using proprietary culture. We're not using synthetic biology. This is the same kind of stuff you'd find out in the lake. We're just We've engineered the system to make that stuff work as hard as it possibly can. Um, and then the last thing, phosphorus, is we're, we're accumulating that phosphorus in the biological cells. So we're capturing it so that it can be reused later. Uh, we're not destroying the phosphorus. Phosphorus is an element that's conserved. So it's not, not going away. So now let's talk about recovery and reuse. What are we doing with that phosphorus? How are we recovering it and reusing? So now we're going to talk about the solids handling side of plants. We're talking about liquid treatment and how this is solids management. So every day in those aerobic tanks, we're, we're growing biomass. Some of the organics in the wastewater being used to grow more bugs. We got to throw some away every day, otherwise these tanks would, would fill up and they wouldn't work anymore. Um, the first thing that we do is we treat that those solids by putting them in a tank to get that that biology to release some of the phosphorus that it, it had accumulated inside itself. And then we thicken that waste to reduce the, the volume of the solids that we have to deal with. The, um, and so what, what you have is, is a matrix of water and bacterial cells where the cells have some phosphorus in them, but they've released a lot of phosphorus back into the water as ortho P or phosphate. So you've got phosphorus in kind of two, two components, the solids and the liquid. We're thickening that up. The solids go to our anaerobic digestion process along with solids from our primary treatments, any kind of oil or grease that we have to deal with, and then all waste. Again, we're digesting that material to break it down, make that into renewable energy, and reduce the, the amount of mass that we have to manage as an end product. Um, but the, the liquid that comes out of that thickening process is where a lot of that soluble phosphorus is. And we're sending that to our strudic harvesting process. The solids then that come out of the digester are very rich. That stream is very rich in ammonia and also has some phosphorus in it. So we thicken that again. The liquid that comes out of that thickening process goes to the strumic harvesting system. So now we're sending phosphorus and ammonia to that strumic system. The thick and solids go into storage tanks and ultimately is what becomes our metrical biosolids that we plant in farm fields. And so those biosolids do have quite a bit of phosphorus in them still, but we have 
kind of direct some of that phosphorus out of the uh, solids into this struvite process to create a different kind of phosphorus product. And the struvite harvesting system requires some chemical inputs to do its job. So we're adding some magnesium and some hydroxide to get the stoichiometry and the pH right. So our solids processing uh, systems do require some chemical inputs to do the job. And the last thing that is, we end up with a survey product that we can sell. Everyone with me? Quick, quick check. Can I put everyone to sleep again? Okay. So, why are we doing survey? Uh, why do we have the survey process? This is a very unique system. Most treatment plants in the country do not produce survey and harvest it. This, we're, we're kind of an oddball here in Madison. Well, the reason is that we get a lot of nuisance struvite formation in the treatment plants. So when you have uh, struvite chemically is magnesium, ammonium phosphate, hexahydrate. Um, you're probably all aware that we have very hard water here in most of Madison, Madison area. There's a lot of background magnesium in the water here. Um, if you were paying close attention to the previous slide, these solids processing systems have a lot of phosphate and ammonia in them. And so we've got all the ingredients to make struvite form inside our processes. And so what we used to have to deal with was a lot of scale formation in our pipes and pumps and our flow meters and things. And we have to rip everything apart and um, you know chisel this stuff out. You got to jackhammer it out or, or soak it in acid. It's, it's a real pain, a lot of maintenance. And so we, we said, let's not do that anymore. Let's try to avoid that. Let's give that struvite a, a dedicated place to form where we can control it and we don't have to deal with it in plant. Um, and the nice thing about that is struvite happens to be a fertilizer. So we're now putting in a system to deal with a problem, but that system also creates a beneficial product that we can. Uh, you know, recover a resource. So, picture up on the left is what that struvite material looks like when we harvest it out of our reactors. It looks like little white pellets. Um, kind of get a sense for scale. The picture on the lower left is uh, my segue into explaining how struvite is used as fertilizer. So, struvite has some advantages over conventional phosphorus fertilizers. It is not water soluble. At neutral pH, it's only soluble in acidic environments. And so the way that struvite is used is it has to be incorporated into the soil in the root zone where plants are grown. You can't broadcast it on the surface, it won't work. Um, so you incorporate it into the soil, the way plants generally uptake nutrients is they secrete acids in the soil to then leach nutrients out of the soil and pick them up. And so then that enables the struvite to dissolve and become available to the plants. And that's how the plant can get the phosphorus. And so what's nice about this type of product is it will not leach into the soil unless there's plant by it. It will just stay there. And so you have very little surface runoff because you're incorporating it into the soil and you're getting very low soil leaching in, in runoff because the phosphorus will not migrate into the soil matrix unless there's a plant near, near it or if the soil is naturally acidic. And so the graph here is kind of articulating that point. The light green line on the top is a map that's monoammonium phosphate. That's a very common conventional phosphate fertilizer. Uh, the lines on the, the bottom are a, a controlled field where no phosphorus is applied and one where struvite was applied. That's the, the crystal green, that's the trade name struvite. What this is showing is that after you know only a couple of days of application, pretty much all of that, that map is migrating into the soil and is leaching in. So it's it's solubilizing and it has the potential to, to become um, phosphorus brown. Whereas the struvite is not being detected in the soil, it's not leaching in, it's staying as a struvite pellet because it's not uh, it's not dissolving under those pH conditions. So it's a it definitely has some advantages as a phosphorus product for agriculture. As this process, 
Um, the struvite is a, a mineral, a phosphate mineral. Uh, at the district, we're producing about 600 tons of this a year that we then sell for agricultural use. And what this enables us to do is export phosphorus out of the watershed in the area. So, you know, there's a lot, there's excess phosphorus in the area. This is a way for us to kind of get some of that phosphorus out of the watershed and deliver it to areas of the country where there may be phosphorus limited. Um, I just was explaining the advantages of phosphorus, that struvite is a, a phosphorus fertilizer and how it has very little runoff potential, but it also has limited applications. So because it has to be incorporated into the soil to be used, it may not be compatible with some farming practices, uh, especially those that are looking at no-till or minimum till operations. So this, this isn't you know, a universal product. It only has certain applications, but where it can be used, it's very helpful. So, um, and the last thing I'll mention about that before I forget is struvite is not the primary product that we produce. The primary product that we produce is our metrical biosolid. So most of the phosphorus that we recover from wastewater is not being turned into struvite. It's kind of a smaller side of our, our operations. Most of that phosphorus is still in the other um, you know, biocells product. Now we're going to do a little bit of a review on that and talk more about the metrical system, the metrical program. So again, we're generating solids, we're processing them to thicken them up. Uh, we put that material into digestion to treat it. And then after digestion, we're thickening that material again. And so when that um, material comes out of digestion, we thicken, this is what it looks like. This is your gravity belt thickener. The material that you're seeing is, is the thickened metrical biosolids. It kind of looks like a dark chocolate pudding. It's about 6% solid, so it's mostly water still, but it, it's still pumpable, even though it's quite thick. And so that material is then pumped and stored into these tanks where it becomes a metrical biosolids, and then we um, get ready to take it uh, to farm fields in the area. So now let's talk about the metric real program. So those tanks are each 6 million gallons of storage. So that's 18 million gallons of storage on site. We fill and empty each of those tanks twice a year. So we are producing and managing about 36 million gallons of this biocells material every year. That's about 7,000 tanker truck trips to fields every year. And during our peak haul out periods, we're running about 17 trucks at any given time on this material. So it's, it's a pretty big logistical operation. When that uh, material is taken to fields, uh, we haul it up to 35 miles from the plant. And we're then using applicator equipment that's similar to manure injectors to apply that material to fields. And we, we practice subsurface injection, so we're not just spraying it on the surface, we're, we're uh, incorporating it into the, the soil. And we do this in kind of two campaigns, what we call fallen seasons. One in spring before crops are planted, so we actually just started hauling on Tuesday for this year. And then we, we haul again in the fall once crops come off fields. And so again, this, this uh, creates quite a logistical challenge for us. We're, we're trying to make 7,000 tanker, tri tanker truck trips in only a few months of the year. And on top of that, not every day the, of those months is sunny. I don't know if you've heard, but it tends to rain in the spring. So, you know, we can't haul when it's raining. We can't haul when the fields are wet because the stuff will tear up the fields and the farmers don't like that. And it's bad for soil erosion. So, you know, the number of days that we can actually haul this material is, is quite small, uh, relatively speaking. And so you know, this is this is quite an operation. I don't quote me on this, but I believe we have the largest liquid class B biocells program in the country. So we're, we're there are bigger plants, bigger biosolids programs out there, but when it comes to this specific kind of biosolids product, I think we are making the most of it. And so, you know, what I was talking about before with, with Struvite, 
and being able to export that phosphorus out of the watershed, you can't do that with this metro product. It, and that's because there's just too much quantity, too much volume. It's still 94% water. It's very expensive. A lot of diesel fuel to, to drive this stuff all over the place. And so our hauling distance is kind of limited by, by this, this physical constraint. So most of the phosphorus that we're covering is being recycled and reused in the area. And so we're very, we're very aware of that. And we're trying to, to really focus on being good stewards of this phosphorus if we have to reuse it in the area. Um, so one of the things that we focused on over the last few years is switching to different kinds of projectors on our application equipment. So we're trying to be in line more with a lot of the emerging ag practices in the area will disturb its ejection. So we're trying to, to disturb the soil as little as possible when we add this material so that we can prevent soil loss and, and um, soil disruption in the fields. We also manage how we apply this material. We only apply to a given field once every three years. That's to allow that field time to you know, deal with that, the nutrients that we're putting on. So multiple crops will pull up those nutrients and that, that then enables us to you know, come back. Um, but so we kind of self-police so that we don't over apply uh, nutrients to these fields and create runoff problems. And to that point, we will not apply to fields that have high soil phosphorus content. So we're testing the soil in the fields that we apply to and to make sure that we are not just you know, throwing material out there at random. Um, we've also been more recently trying to think about how else could we make biosolids or how else could we use the biosolids that we have. So we've been studying doing some additional nutrient availability studies with our material and looking at some alternative products that we might uh, be able to produce instead of a liquid uh, biosolids that's injectable. Um, the reason for that is ag practices are changing. Um, we want to make sure that we always have a place to, to go with our material and that we're, we're in line with, with existing and future ag practices. And also that we're, we're doing as much as we can to make sure that we're reusing this phosphorus in a responsible way so that it's not um, turning into surface water pollution because that's the whole reason the district exists, right? Is to prevent surface water pollution from your sewage. So we don't want, we don't want that to happen in the ag products that we're producing. So to kind of summarize the metro program, you know, this is our, our primary way of returning phosphorus back into the food system. So you made that phosphorus and sent it to us. We'll put it back in the food system so you can have it again. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're, we're managing the application of this of these phosphorus products to prevent phosphorus flow. So we don't want to create problem that we're in the system in the first place to, to deal with. But then we're also trying to manage replication practices to be in line with ag practices, particularly in soil disturbance. Um, the soil health is very important to farmers. It's very important to, to all of us, really. And the soil disturbance is a big part of that because that, that's what leads to erosion and um, less effective growing conditions for farmers. So in conclusion, to wrap this up so we can get to the, the Q&A, um, phosphorus is important. So it's important because we're, you know, we're using it in lots of different aspects of, of civilization. It's important for nature. Everything needs phosphorus to grow. It's also important to manage that phosphorus because if there's too much of it, you have water quality problems. You all, you all are aware of that. The way that we deal with this, this phosphorus pollution with, with sewage is uh, using some complex uh, treatment and recovery processes and operations. So this isn't a simple thing. There's a lot that's going on to deal with, with this material. But importantly, we are very focused on recovering that phosphorus so that it can be reused again. We're not trying to get it and throw it away. We want to make sure that we can use it as phosphorus as a finite resource. 
And lastly, uh, the district is really focused on reuse methods and products that are designed to minimize the negative impacts of using phosphorus, both in terms of um, runoff potential, but also how it impacts soil health and, and the quality of the fields that farmers are looking at. Um, so with that, thank you very much. <laughs> We have uh, 15, 20 minutes for, for questions, and we're going to try to balance uh, questions between those that are in the room, and then we have a, a pretty sizable online audience as well. So we'll start within the room. Uh, the equipment that you use for the treatment method was very interesting. You own it, you uh, created it. Uh, talk about that, please. The, the application equipment? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So, the Venture Grow equipment, what's that all about? So, we are um, you're hauling to the fields with tanker trucks that are anywhere from 5,000 to 6,000 gallons. So we're, we're hauling, you know, anywhere from five to six thousand gallons per trip. When we get that material out to the field, that applicator, the yellow machine that you saw, can either suck the material right out of the, the tanker and then start applying it, or we have what are called nurse tanks out of the fields where we can um, it's sort of like temporary storage so that the, the applicator doesn't have to wait for the next truck to show up. It kind of has a reserve. The the Metrogro applicator is, um, those machines were originally developed for manure application, but manure in, in liquid biosol is good similar in, in uh, qualities. So uh, those applicators are you know, making multiple passes back and forth across the field and um, injecting that material down into the soil. The way they work is there's usually some kind of a, a shank that will go Think about nine inches down, kind of open up a slot. The material is injected into the slot, and then it actually oops, folds the soil back over it, so that um, you know when you're you're looking at it, it, it looks kind of like a restored field. Those those applicators are. I, I'm not a metric program, so I'm, I'm going to kind of be very gentle here, but I believe that that we. Uh, we have the technology to kind of align them with some of the precision ag uh, practices that some farmers in the area are using. So we, you know, we can adjust the application rate to what's necessary for the field. Um, we do test, we go out and test the fields that we're working in. So we're not only looking at soil phosphorus content, but we're also looking at depth to groundwater and proximity to wells. So we have setbacks to prevent uh, well contamination and groundwater contamination. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think that I did I address the question. Did I cover the question? Do we own them? Yes. So we own all of this equipment. We, um, the district owns all of our equipment. We contract the drivers. Um, a lot of small utilities will actually contract the whole hauling operation out to a third party. But we we own all the equipment. We just uh, tend to contract out um, the people operating the equipment. A lot of times, it's the farmers that are getting the material. They'll they'll drive it for us. Just kind of nice. An online question, an interesting one: Is the metro fertilizer produced fall under organic standards? No. Not, not organic. By definition, wastewater biocells are not considered um, an organic fertilizer. Thanks, Matt. To follow up on that question, can you just speak a little bit about the, the cost sharing and how the partnership works between the district and the farmers, uh, private sector, and is the state, the DNR, involved in this process, or uh, this, uh, this whole partnership? Wow, how much time do we have? <laughs> All right, I'll try to break. Again, I'm not uh, the biocells program manager. I'm, I'm kind of in the plant operations, but I'll, I'll uh, try to hit a lot of those points as, as, uh, as well as I can. Yes, the DNR is involved. We have to get a permit from the DNR for every field that we go to. So we have to get permission for every field that we apply to. Um, 
you know, our material is, is regulated under EPA 503 regulations that the deep Wisconsin DNR is tasked with enforcing. So we are working very closely with the DNR with this program. Um, what was the other part of the question? Partnership, Partnership with the farmers, right. So, um, you know, we haul in the spring and the fall, in the spring in particular, there's there's a pretty um, important relationship there in that uh, we have what's called the yield guarantee program. So we will ask farmers to hold off on planting so that we have more time to apply on the fields. And what that means for the farmer is that they have a smaller growing window and they may not be able to produce this large of a yield in the field. So we will compensate them for that um, calculated loss in, in harvest. Um, so we do have uh, some financial incentives for farmers to keep land open for us in the spring. Um, we do not charge for the material or right? we give it away. Um, that is a in my opinion, a big problem in the industry because we are essentially giving a lot of nutrients to the farmers for free. Um, the reason that we do that is because we're making this material every day, whether we want to or not, and we got to take it somewhere. So we do not want to disincentivize our customers from being able to take it. But as an industry in general, we're wondering how we can maybe find a better value proposition there. Uh, but so that, that's a difficult one because we can't just stop making biosolids. We're always going to make Got another online question here, but I do have a quick follow up to that that actually follows in. How many farmers do we work with? Big ballpark. I don't know how many farmers we work with. I believe that we are, we have about 6,000 acres in our inventory that we are working with. You know, we're not applying about 6,000 every year, maybe 2,000 a year. I don't know how many farmers that is because some of the farmers, farms that we work with are quite large. Yeah. Uh, so the question, the actual question I have is what kind of problems did you find with the biosolids applications of as PFAS or other unwanted chemicals? All right, so um, I'm gonna go a little bit further with that one and you know, go back to my toilets aren't trash cans things. One of the big, big bigger issues we have with application is garbage that gets through headworks. It gets through the process and then it can you know, create problems for these applicators. So please, again, don't put garbage on the drain. Um, and that's something that we're working on is, is better screening to keep that material out. Um, we are very aware of concerns with PFAS. It is something that we are starting, that we have been beginning to test for. The problem right now is that the regulatory environment hasn't, uh, hasn't come up with final standards for biocells yet. So it's unclear if you know, what the risk is and, and what we need to do about it from a regulatory standpoint. The good news is we believe that um, PFAS as an issue in the Madison area is, is minimal. Um, we would be very careful with that word. Um, just because there are not a lot of uh, significant PFAS sources in the area. And, and if, if we do find that material, the first thing we're going to do is go and look uh, to address that with, with pre treatment requirements on whatever industrial sources is providing, you know, sending that material out of the soon. So it's something that we're, we're aware of. We're looking at it. Just don't have a full picture yet. Well, I appreciate very much the district's effort to removing phosphorus, but I was wondering whether the district is now considering using natural systems such as wetlands to track phosphorus in place rather than allowing it to enter your system. And of course, wetlands provide other benefits in terms of reducing the incidence and severity of flooding, open space values, and wildlife habitat. So I'm wondering if you're considering protecting some of the wetlands within the watershed. That's a great question. I'm a big fan of wetlands myself. Um, the short answer is no, sadly. But the, the more, uh, the longer answer there is um, wetland management is, is not part of the sewers district's remit. That kind of falls more under the county is my understanding. 
we are not looking at using wetlands as a treatment solution for wastewater, although that's certainly possible on a decentralized scale. The challenge that we have is when you're processing 36 million gallons of flow a day, the amount of wetland space you would need to deal with that is enormous. And, you know, it's just, it's not, um, it's not practical for that, but but for newer development, that's certainly something that you could consider on a decentralized basis. But that's that's not really part of our, our portfolio of solutions at the moment. So I'm sorry about that. No, I think they're looking at that in Milwaukee and some of the transplanter treatment that they're I believe Milwaukee is looking at wetlands more for stormwater management. And here in Madison, the Madison Metropolitan Service District is not responsible for stormwater management. That's outside of our, our responsibilities. On my question, uh, why are other wastewater treatment plants not collecting screw bodies like ours does? So other plants aren't collecting screw bite one because it's a relatively new technology. Um, the district was the second plant in the world to buy one of these systems back in 2013. So technology hasn't been around very long. Um, I think we will we will see more of this type of technology in the future. Um, it just tends to be that you know, the way we build large infrastructure like this is we build it for a 20 or 30 year life cycle. And so a lot of plants just aren't at the point where they need to upgrade or, or do that kind of thing. And it's also has a lot to do with the regulatory environment that a given plant might find itself in. You know, here in, in Wisconsin, we have higher phosphorus requirements are much more stringent than in other places. So that, that's kind of driven us to adopt that technology. But so I think we'll see more of it in the future. It's still just kind of in, we're at the, the earlier stages of it. This is kind of a follow up on that question. And thanks so much. This has been a great science review and a lot of fun. Uh, the, uh, I, I suspect that it sounds like Madison Metropolitan has done a great job of uh, taking advantage of new technologies and being creative. Uh, I suspect that you're also sitting with certain legacy aspects of a plant that was built on decisions years ago. Is, is there anything that uh, you're seeing that might be a big uh, change in the way these treatment plants are being operated in the uh, next 10 years that we're going to have to deal with and are, are there any opportunities under the infrastructure funding that is coming up is here i guess that uh, you may be able to take advantage of great question another how much time do we have uh, so kind of working backwards uh in terms of infrastructure funding um the district is large enough that we don't qualify for a lot of the, the new funding that's been made available at the federal level recently. Um, in terms of what's coming down the pipe, we we are anticipating that nitrogen may become more of a concern in the future. So Wisconsin DNR has been very proactive with phosphorus. It's kind of been we find ourselves in a state that's been very much at the front end of, of stricter phosphorus limits. And so um, we've been working on that for, for a number of years. Nitrogen is probably the next thing. So right now, um, the way that, that we have to deal with nitrogen is we're converting it from ammonia to nitrate. We're not doing total nitrogen removal. So a lot of that nitrogen is leaving and eventually making its way to the Gulf of Mexico. We're anticipating at some point down the road, we don't know how far it might be decades, um, total nitrogen removal may become something that we have to worry about. And that that opens up a lot of opportunities for, for changes in terms of either we one, we could just convert that nitrogen to nitrogen gas and put it back in the atmosphere. I personally would be sad if that's the way we go. I think it would be great if we could somehow uh, recover that ammonia directly yeah. and then put it back into the wind system as well as an ammonia fertilizer. Unfortunately, we don't have um, technologies at scale that are good at doing that cost effectively, but I think we're going to get there. 
Um, there are technologies out there that can recover ammonia to just not cost effective at scale. Um, and then the biggest one goes back to the PFAS question. Um, depending on where we go with, with um, regulations at the federal level and at the state level, um, we and, and what, where we find ourselves with PFAS here in Madison, that, that could have a very significant impact on what we're able to do with our biosolids. Um, so that we're, we don't know where that's going to take us. That's probably the most pressing thing that we're waiting to figure out. Um, my question here, how much phosphorus is still left in the affluent that gets discharged into that fish creek? Too much to return to the Madison lakes? Question. <laughs> Another great question that we, I don't know if we have enough time for, but I'll, I'll try. So, water coming into the plant has maybe six to seven milligrams per liter of phosphorus. We're getting it down to about 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per liter total phosphorus in the effluents. We're getting about 96, 97 percent of it out. Um, under under current rules, our plant is going to need to get down to 0 0.075 milligrams per liter. So that's like another order of magnitude removal. The way that we're currently complying with that, and our, our long-term plan to comply with that is to is to utilize what's called an adaptive management program, where instead of building hundred million dollars in new stuff at the plant. We are going out into the watershed, working with municipalities, farmers, and other land managers to modify land use practices to prevent um, phosphorus runoff into water bodies. And we can quantify the amount of phosphorus that we are um, preventing from entry from non-point sources, and we can get credit for that for our discharge. And so we're actually preventing more phosphorus from entering water bodies than we would discharge the plant. And that, that's our kind of our long term strategy uh, for most of that. In terms of discharging to the lakes, um, there are other nuances there that will currently prevent us from ever really going that way. The big one is chloride. Um, so, right now, we have a lot of chloride from chloride salting and water softening usage. And that, that chloride concentration is probably the biggest thing that would uh, keep us from ever discharging to the lakes if, if that would seem to be a good idea. Right. Is that it? Yep. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. I think we will all be thinking things differently if we flush that toilet today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Matt, for your informative and uh, influencing talk. Um, uh, breaking news uh, uh, from Wisconsin State Journal is that the our community received an additional $15.1 million for the reconstruction of John Nolan Drive. The Clean Lakes Alliance has been working uh, with the city of Madison on some advocacy. We sent some letters off to Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, Clean Lakes Alliance is advocating for John Nolan Drive to be the most sustainable way to get across our lakes and uh, reduce the amount of runoff. So uh, an announcement will be coming out today from the Mayor of Madison, but there's breaking news from the White House. So we're really uh, proud of our work that we've done around that advocacy, advocating for a more sustainable John Nolan Drive. Um, if you didn't get your question answered today, uh, feel free to email us at info at cleaningclients.org and we'll pass along your question. A bit of programming note, uh, next month we will not have any Clean Lakes 101, but they'll be holding the Clean Lakes Community Breakfast. You can buy those tickets online. Uh, we also have uh, single tickets and a student government nonprofit uh, retired person ticket. So look for those. Uh, also, coming up, our big Loop the Lake bike ride, the Saturday of Father's Day weekend. I uh, can go and secure that ticket. It's a wonderful ride around the lake. And again, enjoy the day. It's 81 and sunny. Uh, thank you very much and see you next month. Happy Friends.